What up, though? Check, check, check. What y'all doing, man? Tap in. Let me know where y'all calling from. We're not calling, but you know. <clears throat> Trevor Anderson, what up, though? Where you from, Trevor? That what up, though, seemed real Detroit-like. You got some east side. No, no, no. Trevor, you a west sider. Like, Finkel and uh, you a Brightmore dude. Atwater and Orleans, east side. My initial... My initial assumption was correct, Trevor. Orleans? <clears throat> Man, dog, I got in some trouble over there in Orleans. Deep East. Love the East Side, man. My great granny was on Shoemaker on the East Side. Well, for years, we used to go see her. <sighs> House still in the family, man. My granny was. She used to do work. She was she helped, she owned a restaurant uh, on the east side. My great granny, and she used to cater to the Catholic Church in her neighborhood. And she got so cool with the Catholic Church that they basically gave her the house across the street on a discount from the Catholic Church. I don't know it's a fake name, East Side, but you posted on the West. Okay, I figured that. Trevor Anderson is a fake name. Newhart, that ain't my real last name. I'm not about to put my real name on the internet. Newhart, the meaning, I changed my name when I be, started becoming an actor. If Newhart means, based on Ezekiel 36, that God reached into my heart, changed my heart and gave me a new heart. But, yeah, shout out to you on the east side, man. My ex-wife, the one who shot me, she's from the east side. Seven Mile and Conan. On Gallagher Street. Is that Persian or, or or Osborne right there? Whatever it is, she was about that life. <laughs> One thousand percent, man. <laughs> I hate that. I hate when dudes laugh after everything that they say. That nervous laugh. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what, are you, what are you laughing about, dog? What's funny? Or when dudes change up how they behave when a female is around. That's probably one of the all-time worst. Like, we was just talking about sports, and then all of a sudden, when a bad chick come around, dudes start talking all loud. Man, you know, I, I just uh, was to Somerset Mall and bought them new Gucci loafers, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Why are you laughing, dog? First off, what's, what's funny? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? That's probably one of the people who always say, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Uh, domestic violence. Uh, yay! Who going to the playoffs, man? Who going to the NBA playoffs? On the Jamie Foxx tip? Yeah. I don't know about the, all of the Jamie Foxx tip, but he did say he changed his name because he had a, a problem getting selected for comedy shows. So he changed his name to like a unisex name so people wouldn't know if he was a man or a woman. Yeah, I just changed my last name. Charlie, actually Charles is my legal first name. But my legal last name's not on the internet. Rich Mindsets, what's poppin', man? <clears throat> I'm gonna get into it, all right? I had such a problem the other day watching the Lakers and, and, and uh, uh, Golden State game. It just, it irritated me because every five minutes, 
the uh, announcers kept saying, LeBron's only playing at 70% tonight. He's under the weather. He's only playing at 70%. Like, why, 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 why do we need to hear that? You know what I'm saying? You not playing with the flu like Michael Jordan? Why are the announcers saying you're playing at 70%? Did you prep the announcers to say that under the auspices that you were going to lose? Because you don't have Anthony Davis, which is, by the way, one of the softest big men in the NBA. I can't stand watching him hoop. He's such a broad. While you're hanging out on the wing, you just want to shoot. You don't want to get down there and, 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 and go to the rack. You just you always hurt. You're just a weak dude. GK, unsunken one, what's popping? Where y'all calling from? Not calling, but you know, where y'all from? I hated that. LeBron's only playing at 70% tonight. Okay, that's because he knew he was about to lose, no matter how many points he put up. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like <clears throat> whoever spawn, whoever sh whatever shoe deal you got in the NBA, that's a large part of 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 how the refs see you, how the coaches behave towards you, and the referees. Refs, the public. The announcers, everything is kind of based on your endorsement deal. Because just think of how many dollars that Nike puts in to the NBA and their players. <clears throat> so don't think that they don't have a hand also in the influence of how those players are perceived. Because how those players are perceived publicly drastically affects the sales of the shoes. Tampa. Chicago. The burbs to be you, you GK. I already know you are in uh Naperville right now, and uh, this is usually your voice when you're at work. You let your white friends call you the n word at work, but when you on the south side, you're like, What up, though? Yeah, how y'all feeling? But when you at work, you got this voice, GK. Is no one else is around? Can we call you the n word? And Throw bleach on you? <laughs> <laughs> Can we throw bleach on you? Throw a noose at you if you don't mind? We do that here in the south side. We don't do it in Chicago, you know? I It's so troubling watching the NBA now. Maybe because I'm just so old. You know what I'm saying? Aurora, almost yeah, I know. Aurora, I know where you at. Like, why do we have to announce? Yeah, LeBron's seventy percent under the weather right now. He's seventy percent. He's not feeling. He's only playing at seventy percent. He's under the weather right now. Why? Is that because of his endorsement deal? Like, do I? Do y'all feel like certain players may get a different type of treatment based on their endorsement deal that they have because they have to be perceived a certain way? Just think like. Look at all the bashing that Jordan Poole is getting. I don't even know if he got a shoe deal, but do you think that Jordan Poole would get the bashing that he gets publicly if he had a decent shoe deal? I mean, dude is getting attacked in the media, almost like Javar McGee, JaVel McGee, I mean. But I think if you got a shoe deal, it's almost like you in the mafia. We we'll protect you now. We got to protect your image. These shoes have to sell. We're not going to let you be destroyed publicly because of. And honestly, I think that's a part of um uh why Steph Curry gets so much like flack. Everybody say he underrated. He underrated. Dog got a shoe deal with Under Armour. Like, when was the last time somebody bought? And I know he got a. Great. I love the way Steph Curry plays. He probably got a nice bag out of Under Armour. When was the last time you bought some Under Armour Steph Currys? You know what I'm saying? And 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 does the does Under Armour have the same amount of juice and pull in the NBA as Nike? I don't think so. I don't even know what an Under Armour shoe looks like from Steph Curry. And I feel like that's why uh uh you know because he's not represented by a major shoe company, I think that's kind of why. If you look at how many times he goes to the free throw line compared to most N other NBA players, it's insane. 
Yeah, Under Armour shoes are incredibly mid. Like, I wouldn't wear, I ain't going to sit here in front. I do got an Under Armour workout hoodie. Wear that boy to the gym, get in there and get it done. But I got I got an Under Armour drop. But would I wear Under Armour shoes? That's kind of like where, Under Armour shoes is like the XJ9000s. What are those that you have on? UAs? Even as good as Steph Curry is, signing with Under Armour is like, <laughs> dog, that's like if it's Crips and Bloods in the neighborhood and you join the new game with like five or six members, you're going to get dog walked. Kyrie New Brand go hard. Is Kyrie with UA? Uh, uh, Kyrie shoes go hard. Delaware in the building. No, I'm from Michigan. I I was born and raised outside of Detroit, a little town called Romulus, where the airport is, is when you fly in 30 minutes. I'm from the Burbs. I'm like two parent, loving, functional home. I didn't see no dysfunction, none of that. I ain't, I ain't from the hood. I did a whole bunch of hood activities in my from 14 on, I was kind of out of my mind. But where was I born and raised? Suburbs. Romulus. Look it up. Romulus, Michigan. And you got the, but the flip side is Romulus, Inkster, Belleville, all them little city, cities full of hood black folks. But it ain't Detroit. Anta? Divine Bebop, what up, though? Give them pay less prowlings over Under Armour. Man, Under Armour shoes is so trash. Like, I really would have considered that endorsement deal because I think it has affected how he's treated in the NBA. People who sign with Nike, Adidas, like your the way you're you're treated in the NBA, because they're thinking about your perception. Your perception is going to affect how your shoe sales are. I don't care how many threes Steph Curry hit. Who's checking for Under Armour Steph Curry's? Got to have him, man, because he scored 60 points last night. Man, he could score 1,000. I'm not wearing no Under Armours, dog. Perception is some people's reality. Not everyone. Divine Bebop roasting in the chat already. I'm crying. Charlie looked like he only robbed women. <laughs> Divine Bebop, you used to listen to J. Cole until he apologized to Kendrick, which was the softest move. I was arguing with my brother and my cousins the other day because they was like, oh, man, J. Cole, he going at Kendrick. Oh, it's real hip hop. And I just, I just put in the chat, J. Cole is soft. Man, you crazy. I said, watch, man. I can see it on him. He's a soft MC's weak. Watch. Days later, he apologized. J. Cole is, is so soft and weak. Everything. I, I've never been able to listen to J. Cole. Even before the apology, I can see it on him. I did so much dirtbaggery and crazy street stuff. I can see softness on you a thousand miles away. You gonna make a diss song and then apologize, man? You so tender. You never should have made the song. It's weak, man. Scooty B, you already know what I'm talking about, man. A real G can see softness on somebody. I'm like, eh. That's why I'm glad Drake don't rap about real street stuff. He know what his lane is. It's like, come on, Drake, Aubrey, the grassy actor. We know. You probably seen some street stuff, but you never got your hands in it. Do not behave. That's why I here's my top artist that I only listen to. I love to listen to people who I can tell really did it. I swear Vezo. Uh Sada, well, T Grizzly, Sada Baby, um, All Star JR. Who else? I can tell you did it. 50 Cent. Well, he don't make music no more. 
But what you rapping about, I can tell you did it. But I'm not like a hip hop head anyhow. Like I really need. I ain't gonna lie. I love Sada Baby's new song. It's called Verners. He said, I won't hit a B, but I'll punch a dyke. Knock her out her sports bra up a real strap. <laughs> that's what I want to listen to. I ain't listening to no, oh, you hear them bars? That's not me. I didn't sing too much. HBK. No, I ain't, I ain't never listened to HBK. You talking about dog who got stomped out at Kobo? My man died at Kobo, bro. <sighs> What's dog name? He got stomped out by uh Team Eastside, little dog. I listen to GT. I love GT. I'm not listening to H. I ain't never been been a fan of HBK. I mess with payroll. Who's your top five New York MCs? Nas for show. Sure. King Crooker from the West Coast. I ain't never heard of him. Never heard of him. Nas. Jay Z, I loved I loved Wu Tang back in the day. Jay Z, I listen to I listen to some of uh, Jay Z's music. Now I'm not a fan completely of his lifestyle because you know I've heard some things, but his music. Now we just talking about music, like imaginary players. Is that a 4.0 or 4.6? What's the difference? Your stuff got leathers? But I only listen to music I can relate to. You know what I'm saying? But NBA? Come on, man. I just, I feel like they should, I feel like Steph Curry really should have waited before he signed with Under Armour. Because the story goes, he went into Nike and they confused him with somebody else. And then they walked out of there, went over to Under Armour and signed with Under Armour. Like, I probably would have waited. Like, let Nike apologize, come to you with the right representative. Because, I mean, we've all worked at companies where it's like one person kind of get it wrong. That's not a representation of everybody. Nike, Adidas, somebody. But, bro, Under Armour, even though it was a bag, who going to be checking for – maybe I'm wrong. But are you really going in the store checking for Under Armour gear when you go in? Did y'all release the new fall line? <laughs> Where the Under Armour – where are the Under Armour Timberland-like boots? Reese Money. YouTube ain't notifying you they tripping. He's a roast. He was with Royster 5 9. Who you talking about? King Crooked? Oh, I thought he was called Crooked Eye. Yeah, I messed with Royster 5 9. The slaughterhouse was, was crazy. 30, 30 to 40 grand, cocksucker. Under Armour. Is always on, and I don't understand why. I'm not saying it's a terrible brand, but the way we see it is like, and I think that has to do with the, with Steph Curry's treatment. Because here's the thing: the referees control the tempo of the game in the NBA, flat out. Somebody hot, you know, they hitting three, three after three after three, then they start calling stupid fouls. They mitigate the tempo. Referees mitigate the tempo in the M tempo in the NBA to satisfy whatever the agenda is. You know what I'm saying? And I just feel like if you got to deal with a big shoe company, it will help you. It's almost like being in the mafia because your perception, how you're perceived, is what's going to sell your shoes. So. I feel like it has to do with how he's how they behave. Suge on Under Armour? That's crazy. I just hated hearing when I watched the NBA game that LeBron's only at 70% and then they lost. Like they kept saying that, but he got a shoe deal with Nike. You know what I'm saying? Um, I just feel like we need to address the obvious in certain situations. Like 
man, I just watched this thing where I, I watched uh, 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 Kobe Bryant's father did like a speech. He did an acceptance speech, him and his wife. And just for the record, Kobe's dad, Jelly Bean Bryant, and his wife have been married for almost 50 years. These are Kobe parents. And this was like their first time speaking publicly since his death. And uh, he said, man, he was saying some powerful stuff. He was talking about God. Then he said, uh, you know, some stuff between our family is just private. It's not public because, you know, a lot of people knew that he had a beef with his parents because I guess his mom, uh, Kobe's mama was trying to sell some of his memorabilia for some money. He said she was money hungry. It was kind of public, blah, blah, blah. But the dad never really went public with what was going on. But, you know, it's very well known fact that Kobe was beefed out with his parents when he passed. Right. But the part that we don't really talk about is how Kobe, the day that he passed away in the helicopter, all of the fire, the firefighter, the police, all of the police helicopters, firefighter, everybody in Los Angeles, all of the uh, uh, municipal departments in the city of Los Angeles uh, uh, and, and the surrounding areas downed their helicopters for the day because the visibility was so bad. We can't fly today. Can't fly today. Vis visibility is bad. Every last one of them. So it's one of two things. The day that Kobe got into the helicopter crash, either his, his pilot was like, you know what, let's just do it anyway and not tell Kobe, or Kobe was like, you know what, we'll be fine. But either way, if all of the municipal departments in a city is downing their helicopters because of low visibility, why would you fly anyway? So I don't know who it was on. I don't know if it was on Kobe. You know what I'm saying? But I know how much people worship Kobe, but that don't really matter to me. This is just facts. I don't worship no man. And that's the truth. I think we sometimes, especially as black people, we don't really address the truth if it's somebody that we love, honor, respect, and we just look up to them. We don't look at the real facts. You know what I'm saying? They downed all the helicopters. He flew anyway, flew into a mountain. And he's not only the one, not the only one that passed, but him, his daughter, everybody else on the on the helicopter. What in it now? Now let's just say that let's say that the, the, the pilot was afraid to tell Kobe. Cost everybody their life. Or let's just say Kobe was like, you know what, let's do it anyhow. We'll be fine. Whatever it was, is we weren't truthful about what happened. Fixers don't care about one status. It's true. We don't talk about it. We don't, you know what I'm saying? We don't. And even when Jelly Bean got up to make that speech, he didn't say anything. But he was just like, look, some stuff that's in the family is in the family. And they know. But if you look at the facts, it's unfortunate what happened. And I deal with Kobe. And guess and Kobe had some cold shoes too. He had no under armors. Dog got under armors, man. I guess what I don't understand is why don't we publicly speak truth sometimes within our community? Why don't we just, why why aren't we honest? Like everybody know that OJ did it. We all know. OJ did it. OJ murked the Brown. He murks Nicole Brown. What was that on Friday? He said it. It was on Friday where uh, Cedric and Taylor was like, OJ did it. He did it. Mr. Good Hope, you don't think OJ murked old girl. Look at all the facts. All right, let's go to the facts. First of all, why are you running on a freeway if you didn't do it? O.J. Simpson, who was acquitted in 1995 of murder of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and friend Ronald Goldman, killed her and Ronald Goldman, notorious criminal trials of the nation. They was both stabbed to death outside her condominium in Los Angeles. He was impeding charges in the back of the Bronco, driven by his friend A.C. Collins, 
after being told that Simpson had a gun to his own head. Why are you running on live TV with a pistol to your head? 95 million views, man. What's up, uh, Byron? What you running from, Mr. Good Hope? OJ murked Ronald Goldman and Nicole Simpson. And I don't know nothing about them gloves. If they don't quit, they don't fit, you got to quit. Them wasn't even his gloves, man. Them was Ronald Goldman's gloves. They had small hands. OJ Simpson murked Nicole Simpson. We know that as black people, but we wasn't saying it publicly because it was like we didn't want to agree with white people. Like I was in the gym today and uh, was on the TV screen in the morning. It was like OJ Simpson passed away age 76 and I was talking to this white dude. He was like, what? Man, it's crazy. And he kind of had this look in his eye. I was just like, man, he was one of the greatest that ever did it, right? He was, <laughs> he didn't know what to say. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> but in his heart, I know he was like, man, he killed those white people. I know he did. Caitlyn Jenner tweeted good riddance. I'm crying. Caitlyn Jenner, or uh, or who used to be Bruce Jenner, is mad because one of them kids is OJ's. Which one is it? Uh, I forgot. All, I don't know all of them damn um, kids' names. But one of them looked just like OJ. And it's it's a try. You can see there's a picture of, of uh, damn, what's her name? Dog. Um, Kim Kardashian's mama, whatever her name is, she's in court, and it's like she's married to older Kardashian. She has a uh, Bruce Jenner sitting next to her, and on trial for OJ. So basically, the, the 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 picture said this woman is at her husband's trial, where her boyfriend, who was sitting next to her, Bruce Jenner, while defending her lover. Uh, OJ Simpson. She was smacking all three at the same time. OJ Simpson, Bruce Jenner, and the lawyer uh, Kardashian, who passed away not too long after the trial. You know what's so crazy about that trial is that how attorneys just start dying not too long after the trial. Chris Jenner. Chloe is OJ Simpson's daughter, dog. Look at that big, strong, running back face she got. She's she kind of smackable, too, but it's like, I wouldn't hit none of them. I wouldn't hit none of them if you paid me. What happened? Here's Mr. Goodhope. What happened to all of his bloody clothes, shoes, and knife? Are you telling me he was able to decapitate his wife, slice, her, slice up, and shape her 25-year-old man with a black belt in karate that fought back? Panty's got all the DNA. What's he running from, Mr. Good Hope? If I'm guilty, I'm not on the freeway in the back of my homeboy's Bronco with a gun to my head. So if he didn't do it, he know who did. He paid who did. But all of his all of his actions said I did it, and then he was acquitted on one, but found guilty on the, like the uh, civil civil court charges, and then the rest of his life was madness. I feel like when you're able to get away with one thing, you're not able to get away with the rest. The rest of his life was crazy. He got locked up for beating up a dude over like a signed, uh, like an autographed football or something in Vegas. I'm I'm wrong. I could be wrong about some of the details, but dog. OJ faded, Byron. We can admit it now. I feel you, unsunken one. Bro is on the other side. We didn't want to admit it when he was alive because we didn't want to let white people know they was right. But we was like, man, we know OJ did it, but we're not going to agree with you, dog. So go ahead. But now that he faded, OJ did it, bro. Is this somewhere where he said, I'm not black, I'm OJ? Like he was, 
in Brentwood, living in Brentwood, bro, I'm telling you, man, living in Cali, I've been to Brentwood, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica. I worked in Santa Monica for years. There's a certain type of entitlement you get just for being in the area. And then not only that, man, you, you, you are fairly famous, well-known person in Beverly Hills, Pacific Palisades, Brentwood. Box is so easy. I can't tell you how many chicks I knocked down working at the dealership in Santa Monica. And I'm just, at the time, I wouldn't even say B-list, C or D-list actor, comedian, doing commercials, TV shows. I got my own show at uh, Flappers and Burbank. I'm also doing a show. Depending on who it was, I would change up my voice. And matter of fact, the dealership, it was so much money in Santa Monica. The dealership in Santa Monica, uh, I sold a co car to an older Jewish dude. And make a long story short, he ended up getting me an audition for Star Trek Picard, the speaking part, and I booked the role. Like, that's the idea of the money in Santa Monica, Brentwood, Beverly Hills. Like, so in some cities, we can't even imagine the type of influence and money that these cities have. Just having a conversation with somebody at a grocery store could get you a million-dollar deal, right? But if you're OJ and you in Brentwood, you start to get this level of entitlement like, you know, I'm, I'm not black, I'm OJ. Everything's supposed to happen for me. So you mean to tell me with that level of success and entitlement and he cheating on his, his lawyer's wife he having sex with, he probably hitting. Imagine how many people OJ was hitting at this time. And even white bras. White, black, he hitting them all. But this one who he's got this relationship with steps out on him and starts smacking a younger actor, start letting him smack. He probably can't take it. Because when you in and because when you in that type of environment, especially in Southern California, you start to develop this 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 sense of ownership about the people around you. I own them; they mine. So as soon as somebody he thinks he owns is letting somebody else hit, it's almost like Robin Givens letting the young uh, what's the actor, what's the dog name she was letting hit, uh, uh, Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt was tearing Robin Givens down while she was married to Mike Tyson. And he lost his mind. Santa Monica Pier is lit. Yeah, man. OJ did it. He murked them people out. He had something to do with it. He worked it all out. And I don't think it's no coincidence that most of them attorneys in the situation, died right after. That was crazy. Let's look at uh, Rob Kardashian. It was just for the record, in the 90s, you used to be famous for being good at something, somehow. So how these Kardashians got famous is they ain't even good at nothing. They just got famous because of who their dad is. Rob Kardashian. He's an American attorney and businessman. He died September 30th, 2003. This man is why his family is famous. On top of them being, you know, somewhat beautiful, but he gained recognition as O.J. Simpson's friend before the murder trial. And this friend was choinging Robert Kardashian's wife. He died in 2003. What's the, what's the black dude's name? Uh, that defended him. Johnny Cochran. Johnny Cochran faded. When did he punch out? Johnny Cochran punched out in 2005. Dog was old though. He was 67. I said, the Bible promises you like 70 years. So I feel like when people pass away before age 70, it's like, man, what happened, dog? So he passed away at 67 in Los Angeles, California. Johnny Cochran. 
Well, they didn't die right after. It was 10 or 11 years, so who knows? I think he did it, though. And got away with it. That's why you got to have an attorney. You almost had an OJ situation go down a couple seconds ago. Dude was following my wife to the car. You had to hop out. Hey, man, it ain't nothing like hopping out. Charlie got a shrine of OJ in his kitchen. I'm crying. I love that hop out. I'm all about that hop out. I remember one time this this uh lady and her husband was talking sideways to my 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 ex wife. Now she was like my ex wife was like three months pregnant, and they was in the car talking to her crazy. And they know I was like I was in another car in the parking lot, and she was trying to come over to me, and they cut her off, and it was this exchange. Man, I hopped out the car, I went over there. I'm like, what's going on over here, man? This is my wife. She's pregnant. Oh yeah, we, yeah, we didn't know. It was like. Y'all apologize to her. Apologize to her right now. I don't like how y'all talking to her. They was so shook. We were sorry. We apologize. Like, yeah, man, y'all. What's going on? That ho- I'm a huge fan of the hop out, which I shouldn't be. I'm going to tell you what else. I'm a huge fan of, like, I cut somebody off one day, stuck my hand out the window, apologized, man. I wasn't paying attention. You, I owned it. And then they start following me and, like, getting up next to me trying to run me off the road i just stopped at the light and rolled the window down <laughs> two little hispanic dudes like you cut me off i said but i apologize man but now y'all for the last quarter mile y'all been trying to run me off the road so now everything has changed since that apology the deuce now since y'all trying to run me off the road now i'm pissed there's an auto zone parking lot right over there Y'all pull up over there with me right now. Let's jump out and fight until we get tired. If y'all whoop me, you whoop me. But you just tried to kill me, dog. Run me off the road. Meet me over there in the AutoZone parking lot, dog. You think I went over there and waited by myself. They kept going. I'm not saying I got it all together. That's why I need the prayer. But, like, why you ain't, uh, why you ain't meet me over there? Judge Joe Brown said he studied every page of his court case, and he believes OJ definitely did not do it. Man, okay. Kim did get known after the Ray J, Ray J tape. Ray J smacked her. It's pretty strong. Um, My only thing about the OJ case is that I just don't understand. Like, if you didn't do it, why you running? Why you running? Divine Bebop uh, had surgery yesterday for anal lining tear. Spent a couple weekends with Tevin Campbell. His anal line, anal lining is a little tore up, man. But they said it should heal within the next 30 to 60 days. Lars P. OJ did it. Fight till we get tired. That's my turn. OJ did it, man. OJ did it or had something to do with it. Why you running? Why you in the back of the Bronco running? Well, I ain't guilty. I ain't running. Uh, Charlie, I reached out to you a few times on Instagram. Been watching you for years. Follow your blueprint. Really want to interview on my channel one day. Let me know a price. Darian Swish is a smart man. I like that. Darian Swish gets right to the bag. He said, how much for an interview? I'm going to give you my email, G. As long as you ain't got nothing weird. Like, I don't take my gift everywhere. So as long as you ain't got nothing weird on your channel or, you know. You got shirtless pics on your page next to Diddy or stuff like that. Other than that, uh, shoot me. I just sent you my email. Shoot me, uh, shoot me the info, man. We'll, 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 I pray about it. We'll look into it. But as long as you ain't doing nothing weird, we can make it happen, dog. Like, you do an interview with somebody's page. Like, I'm telling you, I don't take my gift everywhere. So, you could be like. Just had a great interview with Charlie. And now we're going to talk about how anal lining tears are okay. You know, it's we're going to talk about how the alphabet community is actually right. (laughs) 
Charlie set up, look like a casting couch. James Posey. James Posey uh, joined the karate class after he got beat up over a parking space at Target. <laughs> That's my space. He hopped out. He got dog walked by two little Asian dudes. And then he jumped into a karate class. Like, I, want, I need to join a dojo. I need to know how to scrap. Uh, what's up, Christian Clayton? So we talking about OJ, man. You think he did it or what? I think OJ did it, man. And then not only that, it was all these cases of domestic violence, a record of domestic violence against Nicole Brown. Like, it's almost kind of hard to trust who you attract when you reach a certain, well, I wouldn't say that. It was not hard to trust. I just think you should be more cautious about who you trust as you start to attain more success and, and, and in life. You know what I'm saying? Because the people you attract may not be for your best interest. They got, and everybody has, my therapist told me this the other day. He said, everybody has three things. I hope I can remember. He says, we all have like ulterior motives, insecurities, and vulnerabilities. All of us. So when you're dealing with somebody, just know that like you all, when you're going into a situation like you meet a beautiful woman, your ulterior, ulterior motive may be, I just want to smack. I don't really want to get close. But you also have vulnerabilities and some insecurities. You are, and this thing is a balance. So you reach this level of success that those three things may remain the same. You meet a beautiful woman who may not have that level of success that you have. Her ulterior motive may be security protection. You know how many women marry old dude, old rich dudes just for the security? She 32, my man's is 90 or 70. And it's just like, that's security. And she may sacrifice maybe her sex life, some of her happiness, but it's like she know her and her kids is going to be straight. He said, Charlie Green Eyes came from his German transgender grandfather. I'm crying. <laughs> Bro is removing all the shirtless pics off his, of his Instagram as we speak. Who? That's funny. Charlie Green Eyes came from his German. That's funny. You tell people you own an apartment complex, but you're really just the manager. <laughs> you, you kind of do that don't believe in Jesus, but you think crystals have power. <laughs> OJ did it, dog. All those years of domestic violence, running from the police. I remember watching the trial. It's just that we couldn't say it publicly to white people. Even now, when he died, it's like they don't know what to say. But I can see in their eyes what they say amongst they, they, their peers. Like, about time. He killed that beautiful white woman, Nicole Brown. It's a shame. I was thinking about doing this sketch uh, just to see how people react. Of, like, I, I get a white woman with me. Um and we go to a rural a rural town down south and and I got her like I got a leash around her neck and a chain and we walking around in the grocery stores and I'm telling her what to get out the grocery store like pick that up get them frosted flakes quit playing just see how people respond and before they pull a gun on me I'm like look we just playing man we just see how <laughs> see how they react like you see that coon what he's doing just got that pure white woman getting his groceries with a leash on. 32-year-old had a side dude or two. Of course. Of course she did. She had a 25-year-old side dude. So when she met OJ, she had ulterior motives. Like, who else would kill her other than her husband and the lover? Who else did it then? So if OJ didn't do it, who did it? So 
So everybody in the chat that's saying OJ didn't do it, who did it? If OJ didn't do it, OJ did it, man. We got to be real about... I'm going to tell you how I knew OJ did it. I don't know if y'all... You know he played for the Buffalo Bills back in the day. And in November 1972, there's a sound bite. You can look it up online. There's a sound bite of, of, of OJ Simpson in the huddle. Right? So his wife, her name was Nicole Brown Simpson. So OJ's in the huddle in 1972. This is probably 20 years before he met Nicole Brown. But in the huddle, they're playing against Cleveland. And the soundbite in the huddle, you know what OJ says? We got to kill the Browns. <laughs> that's what I knew. That's all, the, that's all the evidence I need right there. He said it in 1972, dog. That was a drug deal going bad. I'm crying. The cartel. We got to start being real, man. Because we, what we don't want to do is like, we don't want to publicly agree with other races about how they see us and how we respond. But the truth is the truth. I mean, also too, like, what's dog name? Obama's not black. Obama is not black. His dad is Nigerian. His mom is white. Nigerians hate black people. Because they think that we squandered our opportunity. We don't know what we're doing in the America, in the Americas, and we lazy. So Obama ain't black. And Obama didn't do anything for the black community. He did more for the alphabet community than he did for black folks, which, which is suggesting Obama could be a pirate. But we don't want to say that publicly. No, no, Obama, oh, wait, we won't change. And then we looked at what he was doing like, man, this is, what are you doing, dog? He painting the White House in rainbow colors. And if, that, if that's his thing, I'm, you know, I'm not mad at dog. I'm just saying, stop saying he's black and he's for black people. He wasn't. As a matter of fact, you can look up the story. There was a choir director in Chicago who claimed to have relations with Obama threatening to write a tell-all book. And it's like weeks later, he got uh, shot up in a drive-by in front of his church. Not the way he wanted to get sprayed on. <laughs> he wanted to get sprayed on in other ways. He didn't want to get sprayed on with bullets. Dog faded. You look it up. Obama, he ain't for black folks, man. Nigerians hate black people. Let me tell you something else, too. Just because Malik Yoba played a tough guy in New York undercover, we believe that he's a tough guy in real life. Malik Yoba is a pirate. Malik Yoba is on the other side. He's into uh, 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 men who behave as women. So I don't. I feel you. He ticked me off the first election, but not the second. Malik Yoba. We got to believe. We just got to be 100, man. Just because he act like, man, Malik Yoba is 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 a predator. That's what Corey Holcomb said, which is true. He's a predator. He's a pirate. He doesn't. He prefers to be with men who look like women. Young Buck. We love his song. Shorty want to ride with me. We could get low. Come on, man. He got too much history of, of picking up people that's on the other side. We could just accept that. If that's their truth, fine. Just stop lying about it, man. And stop being deceived. We get too, one of the worst things we can do as people is get emotionally invested in the decisions of other people and then start being biased and lying. No, they don't do that. Come on, all the facts is there. OJ Simpson was on the freeway in the back of his friend's car with a gun to his head. Right? Are you talking about he didn't do it? Oh, okay. Young Buck got numerous allegations of, of laying down with people that's on the other side. And we like, no, nah, man, he made the shorty want to ride with me. How you know you was talking about abroad? <laughs> Malik Yoba had crusty lips in every TV show. That white stuff on his lips was not crust.
We just got to be honest. And if that's your truth, that's your truth. I ain't hating on you. I'm just saying we in the black communities just kind of have this thing where we are willing to overlook certain things because we think these people are for us. Obama for us. He ain't black. And here's the thing. We're not hating on people who choose an alternative lifestyle. We all knew Luther Vandross and Tevin Campbell was gay. Everybody knew it. If you don't know it, you're blind. Tevin Campbell, all of his mannerisms were sweet. Can we talk? And he just, he finally came out and said, hey, I've been a pirate my entire life. I just never wanted to say it publicly, so he's finally admitted it. Even Luther Vandross, who makes a song called Dance With They Father? Who, who, what man dances with their father? I want to dance with my father? I'm not trying to dance with my daddy. I dance with my mom. I'm not dancing with my daddy, man. You know what I'm saying? He's a pirate. Come on, man. We acting like, do you know that 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 individual that Eddie Murphy picked up back in the day end up getting killed like months later, like execution style? Why are we acting like that didn't happen? Now, I'm not saying maybe Eddie, maybe Eddie was a pirate. Maybe he wasn't. I'm just saying, why don't you look at the facts? Who's picking up a pirate at four in the morning? Unless you are one. We be ignoring stuff as black folks. Like, no, 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 because he made, you know, coming to America. That means there's two different worlds in California in the entertainment industry. Let, let's exclude California. There's what you perceive someone to be because of the art that they've been a part of. And that's who they really are. Just because somebody has made great art that you love does not mean that they don't have a personality or a side that you may not even know about. You got to stop thinking the two are the same. Malik Yoba on New York, New York undercover as this tough, strong heart. You, he, come on, man. That's not him. He's a pirate. You know what I'm saying? Usher being up there grabbing on the ladies, doing all these songs. And it's like, I like that. You know what I'm saying? He out here giving men and women herpes. That's the real. And why do we as black people think that just because this person creates art that we love and they have a certain narrative and they art that that's who they are in real life. It's not true. It's not. And it's nothing wrong with, Whatever they doing in their personal life, really, it's on them. It ain't got nothing to do. I'm not saying a person is good or bad based on what they do in their personal life. That's not my call. All I'm saying is, is we got to be real when, when we see celebrities. I hate the way we worship celebrity, especially in the black community. We ignore so many things with a person based on the fact that they may be on TV. They may be on this show. I know so many people who've been on shows, TV shows, movies, in real life. They are very interesting. And broke. You know how many broke celebrities I know? Don't want to go get a bag. Cheek Mills. Teddy Pendergrass, too. Man, he was getting domed from a from a someone in the community. And I guess the, the dome was so good, he ran into a tree. Looks like another love TKO. But if that's that person's choice in their personal life, that's fine. It's just that I get mad when people become delusional with thinking that they'll never do that because they were successful in the NFL or the NBA or just because they were successful professionally does not mean that that person is not a human. I don't know if Cheek Mills is getting smacked or not, but I'm just saying. I wish we could just... Be honest about, you know, I think, you know, another thing that bothers me too, I'm, I really, another thing that bothers me is why do we, the dude who played Michael Schofield on Prison Break, I don't know too much about Dog. Tell me about him. I will say there was a TV show called The Shield.
If you were a male exotic dancer and you did a bachelorette party, what would you do if one of the women who topped you up were trans after the fact? First of all, I wouldn't be getting no top from nobody at no, if I was a male exotic dancer, I'd be about money. I'm not getting no dome from nobody at no damn. So that sounds like a personal experience for you, Baba, Baba Samurai. Why, why did you let that man give you helmet at a bachelorette party? Because that sounds like a very personal story. Why did you, you didn't notice his jawline and his strong neck and hands? What happened? My man was 6'3". It went down on you. Why'd you let that happen, Baba Samurai? I can't relate. I don't have any kind of those experiences. And the fact that you typed that in the chat is an indication <laughs> of your true desires of getting your anal lying torn by another hard leg. That is unfortunate, man. Man. I hope you get the help that you need, you know, to be an successful, successful person in life after your anal lining, lining got tore. Uh, so, what was I going to say? We got to be honest, man. We have to be honest about I don't also too I don't like making generalized assumptions. I've talked to a lot of people that have had horrible relationships with black women and they're like all black women is the same. Why? Just because you chose two rats? I don't like that. Just because you chose two rats don't mean all black women is trash. All oh, man women is hoes. Oh, because you chose two hoes? W Booba, what up? I don't I don't really I'm not a fan of that, man. I don't like when people generalize, man. All black churches is trash because you went to one black. Oh, all church is garbage. Church is just because you went to trash churches growing up. I went to some great churches, man. All black businesses is garbage. They don't do uh, professional stuff just because you experienced a few. Like, I just don't like that generalization. I've been to some terrible black churches. I've been to some great ones. You know what I'm saying? I grew up in a church called First Baptist Church in Romulus. Charles Woodridge was the pastor. No scandals. No taking the money. Nothing fruity in the church. Choir director wasn't fruit. None of that. It was just real, very animated characters in there, though. Like, we used to go through church. We had what was called... Uh, now, my whole family went there. My mom, my dad, my dad's side of the church, and my mom's my dad's side of church my dad's side of the family and my mom's side of the family all went to the same church my grandparents you know they've been made when they passed away they was married 65 um you know 65 something years my parents right now have been married for 50 years all of our family went to the same church in romulus and we had what was called the right hand of fellowship after church where we would walk through and shake every all the deacons hands and all the ministers and the pastors at the end of church and Mr. Holloman used to squeeze the heck out of my hand. His hands were so big. Hey, baby, how you doing? You know what I'm saying? Um, who else was animated in the church? Mr. Courtney. I'll never forget Mr. Courtney. He was in the choir stand one day because I sang in the choir at church. I said I sang in the male chorus, me, my brother, and my dad, and in the kids' choir. And Mr. Courtney in the male chorus one day during a break in between songs at rehearsal he said and this dude's like 75 with a yellow suit on and he waited till it got quiet at rehearsal and he said hey y'all i went to the doctor the other day and that nurse touched my leg and my thing went like this and he looked at everybody and i knew exactly what he meant and then we just went right into the next song. <laughs> that was the most scandalous stuff we experienced at the church. No scandal. Every black church ain't bad. Later on in life, like 2004, five, one of my friends, his name was Rory Javitas. He got saved. I remember we used to hang out all the time. 
And then one day he was like, I can't hang out no more. I can't drink no more. And I was like, what's going on? He was like, I, I met this girl. I started going to this church. It changed my life. And I watched how it changed his life. And he said, you should come to my church. It's called Detroit World Outreach. It's a telegraph in Chicago. And the only, the only reason I went is because I watched how much he changed. Because we, we would party, get it in, completely changed. I went to the church. It changed my life. You know, and it was it was multicultural. It was white, black, Asian, everything. It was one of the greatest churches I've ever been a part of, you know. And then, but the two pastors, they passed away. Bishop Jack Wallace, he passed away in 2005. I had only been there a year. Then the next pastor, Bishop Ben Jabert, he was there 12 years, passed away 2017. So I've seen some terrible churches, and I won't even mention them, but I've seen some great churches. So it ain't all bad churches in the black community, man. Facts, Brittany. Detroit World Outreach is one of the best churches ever. W. Booper. You called the bank this morning to contest your overdraft fees. I just went last Sunday. Been reading the Bible all week. Shout out to you, Terrence Reynolds. Hey, man, the Bible says that to forsake not the assembling of yourself. You know, you got to be assembled in church. Now, nah, I'm not the person to tell you you got to be there every time the church doors open, every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, every, you know, even if you go two Sundays a month, but assemble yourself with other believers. You know what I'm saying? But also read the Bible for yourself. Don't believe everything a pastor says. And this is how I look at church. Um, I look at church the same way we look at buying houses and cars. Like, you go look at several houses before you buy one. You look at several cars before you buy one. Why don't we do that with church? And then we get mad like that church was trash. The car, the first car you look at and you bought would be trash. The first house you look at and you buy in some cases is trash. So you do research on your church. I mean, you do research on your car, your house. Why don't we do research on the churches we go to go to and visit 10 to 15 churches in a year before we decide which one to go to? Same with a spouse. Why do we date, take our time before we choose? Then we get mad at our choice. Can't get mad at people for your choice. You know what I'm saying? When W. Boop, if you whisper W. Boopa's name at, at a massage parlor, they'll bring a little young Asian boy out. <laughs> uh you spray air freshener on your jeans, man, just when you don't want to do laundry. Um, so I just don't like the fact that we, 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 we put in one category, everybody, just because we had a terrible experience with that terrible experience with black women, all black women is trash, terrible experience with a black church, all black churches is trash, black business. It's like, come on, man, we got to support each other. You know what I'm saying? We got to be honest. I came from a two-parent, loving, secure home with no dysfunction. My parents been married for 50 years, never saw them fight. My dad never drank, never did drugs, kept a great job at Detroit Edison and had a side hustle. We grew up with a, you know, in Romulus, we had a little above ground pool in the backyard and all the kids in the neighborhood would come by. It was always family event at our house almost every weekend in the summertime. So game night, I saw just love, affection. I never saw no drama, crazy fights, none of that. I got a little crazy because I had cancer at 15. It changed my whole life. It was a childhood trauma. So my parents was looking at me like, I don't know what's wrong with you. Like, But I experienced a trauma at a young age that I didn't have no control over, and it kind of made me a little crazy, which is why I'm still in therapy now. But Pennsylvania got massage parlors in America, no cap. Oh, man. So you talking about, I already know what tip you on. Glendon Johnson, what up, though? Glendon Johnson, his pastor counsels him with the door closed while Luther Vandross plays in the background. <laughs> you in here for some counseling therapy? Let me close the door and cut on this uh, dance with my father. <laughs> we got to be honest man that's the type of background that i come from you know and i remember for years when i was younger i used to want to have this narrative of like you know from the hood or uh uh, uh 
you know, I experienced certain things that I may not have experienced. And honestly, at to this point in my life, it's like, this is my past, man. This is what I've been through. This is what I've seen. I didn't get wild until I had cancer and I, I really lost my mind. I, I went from Heisenberg. I went from Walter White to Heisenberg at age 15, 16. And that probably lasted. So I was about 30. But we got to be honest. You use toe spreaders to clip your toes? <laughs> what? You mad at me because you cried at a Jesse Jackson uh, ra rally last week. Rainbow Coalition. The Rainbow Coalition for you means two things. That's funny. Charlie looked like a middle school PE assistant. James Posey got into a fight at a Tevin Campbell concert, man. It's, for some reason, his pants was off. <laughs> I need y'all to be honest, man. There's so many things in our society that's keeping us from telling the truth. I watched this video the other day. I saw this commercial about pop on veneers. And it was these people that their whole top teeth was jacked, missing some. And it was this little pop on kit. You could just pop on. People just walking around with a whole fake grill. There's some of them people doing that right now. Y'all know veneers stank, right? If you don't take care of them. There's some people out here with some reckless chiclets that got on, got a Velcro grill in their mouth right now. And you talking to them confidently, shorty at the grocery store with all of that wagon. She probably got a mouthful of fake, fake chiclets. Wagon fake. She probably got on, she probably got a, a BBL. You know, if you don't wash that BBL thoroughly, it'll stink. Fake veneers, fake be fake booty. Anything about old girl is fake. And you just logged in. But then one day when you get to know her and she snapped that Velcro grill off and you see them real chiclets. Ooh. What you going to do then? You already locked in. You already locked into the soul tie. You didn't smack. Y'all got a baby on the way. Baby come out and his gums is messed up because his teeth going to be messed up. <laughs> You got to be real. Also, be real, too. If I'm interested in you in a relationship and you are a grown side baby, you need to tell me. What's a grown side baby like? You, Your mama had sex with a married man and you were born and your father didn't want nothing to do with you growing up. You need to tell people. You're a grown side baby. You grew up hating your father because he didn't want nothing to do with you because you was the side baby. Like, why are you not telling people that, man, At the in the beginning? Because your behavior shows us what you've been through. You hurt, you offended, you hate your father, you mad at your mama for getting smacked by married dudes, you're grown. I feel like grown side babies should live in their own community. And people who got mental health illnesses that don't want to take their medication, they should all live in one community. Unless you saved, redeemed, you love God, you got a relationship with him, you change. But if you don't, you know what I'm saying, you hate God, you hate all men, you don't have any strong relationships around you, and or you got a mental health disorder and you don't want to take the medication for it, everybody, those all, all those people should live in one state like North Dakota. You should just procreate with the people among you. Not grown side babies. If you're a grown side baby, you should tell people when you meet them. If you're a female and your daddy was a base head growing up, you should. <laughs> you should tell somebody the moment of dating. I just want to tell you that my dad wasn't in my life because he was a crackhead. That, that'll tell me a lot. You tell people Tony Terry is your idol. What's that song Tony Terry did? Tony Terry had a cold little song, man. I can't remember what it was. When I'm with you, 
Sunshine's my way when I'm with you. Oh, let's look at the recent images of Tony Terry. What dog look like? All right, well, he ain't aged that bad. Tony Terry. When I'm with you. Glendon Johnson, your fart start ma stopped making a sound when you after you did a year in juvie. You just got loose shanks now, man. You was in there getting blasted. When I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. So if your daddy was a bass head, you need to tell people. Because now we know why you behave a certain way. You know what I'm saying? Your daddy was on drugs. He wasn't around. I don't have that narrative. I don't know that story. My dad didn't do drugs or he wasn't on alcohol. If your daddy was a crackhead or a heroin addict, you need to tell people right in the beginning. So now I know how to behave with you. Now, if you say again, I'm redeemed, I'm saved, I got a great relationship with God, love my dad, everything's cool, then that's a different story. But if you like, my daddy was a crackhead. And I hate him. And, you know, and all this other stuff, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to behave. Grown side babies come with issues. They do. Babies of base heads come with issues. And I ain't talking about a crack baby. Because if your mama was on crack and you was in her stomach, then you a crack baby. But if your daddy was on crack and your mama wasn't, and now you hate your daddy, you're not really a crack baby. You kind of like a, I don't know. You a side crack baby. Addictive behaviors and personalities is my point. And you walking around with all this hate and anger towards your father. And it's like, what? what's going on? Oh, your daddy was a base head. Oh, now I understand because generationally you have certain type of personality disorders and certain things that are you may need to fight through with prayer, therapy. And I'm not saying people can't be redeemed. I'm just saying, if you know what you're dealing with, let me know what I'm dealing with in the beginning, right? My dad sat me down years ago and he said, these are the issues that's on your bloodline that I don't want to be bothered with. He said, alcoholism. He said, you know, my dad and my and my grandfather both abused alcohol. That's why I don't drink. He said, but that's on your bloodline. You got to be careful. He said, abusing women. My father and my grandfather had issues with this. You know, he was like womanizing. And, all, and, that's, and honestly, those are the things that I have dealt with my entire life. And I'm honest with a woman in the beginning. Like, man, my, my granddad, my great granddad dealt with womanizing and alcoholism. My dad didn't portray that lifestyle in front of me at all. He defeated it, but it's on my bloodline. I got to be careful. And I've been a dirtbag, lying to women, telling them one thing, doing something else, drinking. I stopped drinking alcohol for 12 years from like, oh, I used to fight all the time when I drank. Years ago, when I was young, 21, 22, I stopped drinking when in 2007 when I got married. So for 12 years, I didn't have a drop of alcohol. In 2019, started drinking a little bit because of the pandemic. Nothing like how I used to. My temperament changed. But I'm just saying, I have to be careful now. Even, even now, I just do like six months no drinking, three months no drinking. Or I won't drink all week and maybe have a couple drinks on the weekend. But I don't drink nowhere near the way I used to because my dad warned me, womanizing, alcoholism is on our bloodline. So you got to be careful. He said, I beat it. That ain't my issue. He said, I've been married to your mama X, Y, Z years, never cheated on her, blah, blah, blah. I don't drink. You know, so it's like he stood in the gap and defeated certain things that I didn't have to deal with. And that's our job as men sometimes for our kids is we got to stand in the gap and be the one who defeats the generational iniquities through God's help so that our kids don't have to deal with it. How did your dad break the curse? Does he attribute it to the church? Man, he... um. He saw so much. He saw so much growing up. He had a really praying. He had a praying mom. That's why you really got to be careful the women you pick to have kids by and live with. He picked his mom. My granny was a real prayer warrior and a believer who was hands on with her kids. So some of it had to do with his relationship with his mom. 
because she was hands on with all her kids and she taught them. A lot of women now, well, I wouldn't say a lot. There are some women now who are so self-absorbed, they don't take the time to teach their children. Home training. Proverbs 1 and 8 says that uh, uh, a man, basically, and I'm paraphrasing, that a man sets the standard in the house and a woman teaches. That's the biblical mandate of a, of a, of a relationship. Man sets the standard. This, 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 and this is how I want the order. He sets the order. And a woman teaches and makes sure that the order is set, is, is, is enforced based on the rules that the man set in the household based on the rules he got from God. But if you got a woman who won't teach, all she want to do is be a weekend mom, take the babies out for the weekend, do her own thing during the week. And she got to every other day get her hair and nails done. She want to hang out with her friends. And she watching all these reality and all this other stuff. It's like she more concerned about herself than teaching her kids. Why do you even have kids? So that's the type of woman that my father had growing up. Rest in peace, my granny. She was one of my best friends. So it was my grandmother. It was it was, you know, having him in church. But more importantly, it was him praying, her praying over my dad. Going to church every Sunday ain't going to save you and it ain't necessarily going to change you. But prayer will change you. The Bible says that uh, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. So my granny's prayers, you know, I think that was a big part of changing him. And what he saw growing up, he broke the curse. I'm more of a dirtbag than my dad, and I'm still praying and working on some stuff. That's why I'm in therapy now, because it seemed like it's almost like whatever he could have dealt with skipped a generation. And now, like, things happen in my life that I had no control over like getting cancer at 15, two surgeries, eight months of chemo, like that was traumatic. And then during that trauma, the enemy was coming to me like, well, you know, you can get over it by doing this, 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 and this. My dad never had those issues growing up. You know what I'm saying? Breaking generational nigga, pastor grabs you from behind and baptize you. <laughs> uh, Liquor keep me truthful. You lied to a bra when you sober. Hey, man, I've lied, too. I ain't gonna lie. I've lied several times and then had to just come back and just tell the truth. Like, man, I apologize. Shouldn't have said that. Like, that's one thing about me. Like, I can't live a certain way for a season. I can't live, like, for years and years. And years. I got to break down. Like, you know what? I did this. I apologize. I shouldn't have did this apologize for this or i get revelation while i'm in therapy and working on certain things it's like i never want to feel like i've arrived i don't have it all together i don't i'm working on it i'm in school to be a psychologist well a licensed therapist right now with a concentration on trauma i did three years at eastern michigan university dropped out in 03 because i was getting money now i got a year year and a half left to finish but now i'm in school studying what i really want to do is, is psychology human behavior so I'm learning things about myself while I'm studying. I'm in therapy now. I write in my journal every morning. Like I kind of, I want to always constantly be growing. I don't have it all together. I mean, I don't think I ever, I'm never going to be arrived. Like I got it together. I got some stuff that I'm working through. So, um, Dewan B, what's going on, man? You know, I was talking about you in a previous episode, man. What I respect about you and a lot of people on the panel is one of the things Dewan taught me was um, the importance of 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 uh, just mental health. Because he talked about counseling kids and uh, being there for the kids and what he saw. And honestly, that's why I'm, one of the reasons I'm back in school pursuing psychology, uh, behavioral science with the concentration on trauma is because of what I heard Dewan say in that room. You know what I'm saying? Even though I know I can't leave uh, a 12 pack of cookies around Dewan, he'll lose his mind. Other than that, his mind on mental health and the way he retains information is 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 next level. Dewan retains information here like that. Dude is like a walking library. He also retains water, but the way dog retains food, insane. 
I got so much love and respect for you, Dewan B. Miss you, dog. We got to connect soon. Nothing but love from day one, man. And Dewan is in a <laughs> hilarious comedian. When we did that show in Vegas, killed the crowd. So not only is dog logic, uh, uh, just incredible source of logic, knowledge, funny dude on stage. I respect your grind and your hustle. One love, Dewan B. 1,000%. Charlie go to school to be a pubic hair tech. I'm crying. <laughs> oh, man. You let the assistant pastor at a church grab your booty one time when nobody was around. You didn't tell nobody. That's why you don't like church, W. Booper. Yeah, Dewan is 1,000. Everybody on the panel was always 1,000, man. I got so much respect for everybody, man. Craig, Brandon, Dozy. I was able to learn so much from everybody in that room, man. And it ain't nothing but love and respect, man. I appreciate y'all. He said, Dewan, everybody big homie. <laughs> ah! Rich mindsets is a fool. Oh man, I'm crying. Um, yeah, Dewan B is that guy, man. Y'all got to check out his podcast. Check out his channel. Dewan B is the one that got me on. Man, is the book close by? I hope it is, bro. Man, he put me on this book. By Dr. Claude Anderson. I don't see it over here and I'm pissed because I want to grab it. Um, damn. Well, I'll just say it's called Black Labor, White Wealth, Dr. Claude Anderson. Him and Craig put me up on this book. One of the best books I ever read. You got to read that book. And also Craig put me up on this book called uh, White Trash. And it talked about how the America, America started where all the other countries sent their garbage people here. Criminals vagrants everybody that didn't want in england and other countries they was like look you got committed you committed a crime in another country they'd be like look we need to give you 10 years in prison here we send you to the americas or oh, we go to the americas is that's part of the reason how america started so i don't want to give do i don't want to give uh big dog too much attention man he gonna eat it all up we know we know dog loves to eat so one thousand percent we gonna keep the show going um, so I don't know if y'all remember in, in, in Detroit. Yes. Right. As indentured servants, which is different than slavery. That's why I don't like that narrative. When some people of other races be like, well, we were slaves too. No, you were an indentured servant. You had an opportunity to pay for your freedom to leave, or you had a season in which you had to serve. And after that season, you left and you were free. We were slaves, meaning no matter how long we worked, no matter what we did, we couldn't buy our freedom. And our kids was born into slavery. So stop with that. It's the same. It's not the same, dog. Flat out. I had a really interesting conversation. Um, well, let me read what Jamal Jones said. Hey, yo, your dad beat your family curses by living Proverbs 16, 6. By loving kindness and truth, iniquity is exploited. And by the fear of Jehovah, men depart from evil. That's facts. That's absolute facts. That's how my dad was able to defeat a lot of the things that was on his bloodline is like it was by truth. And loving kindness. My grandmother was constantly giving him truth, praying for him, praying for the whole family. Like, I look at all of her kids, all of my grandmother's kids. She had five. All of them married one person and stayed with that person. And only one person, my, my dad's sister that was born right after him, her husband passed away a few years ago. But every one of my granny's kids is married to their first mate. 40, 50 years. My dad would be married 50 years in June. He's 70. He'll be 74. He healthy. Rides a bike. Never did drugs. I never seen him drink alcohol. Like my dad, he every Thursday growing up, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, he did this thing in the hood called Bible, basketball Bible study where you had to come to Bible study for the first 30 minutes. And then afterwards, we play basketball at a local school for like two hours. But you had to come to the Bible study first. He did that every Thursday growing up. 
But my granny prayed constantly for her kids that they would be free. And every last, I'm saying, I ain't saying nobody, everybody's perfect. But what I am saying is every last one of my grandmother's kids is married to the first person they married still. And we all was close. All my cousins, we all was kind of born around the same time. We was all like brothers and sisters, always at my granny house. And I miss that. Because she passed away in 2018. And it's, it's almost like we ain't even been as close as we was since then. But I miss everybody. You know what I'm saying? But I got to just continue to keep moving. Because I kind of had a different path, too. You know, I had cancer when I was when I was 15, and it changed me. It turned me from Walter White into Heisenberg. And I started doing, I was wild because I didn't think I was going to live. A doctor give you a 50-50 chance to live, and you don't think you're going to live a long time. Even after the cancer diagnosis is over, you're going to behave a certain way. And that was me. Wilding. But I think that because God healed me, it gave me a healing anointing where I started attracting broken people. And I just did not have the wisdom that just because you attract a broken person, that don't mean you need to allow them to be close to you. So since I was never really, and I love my parents, I ain't hating on them, but I was never really taught how to pick. Or, hey, Charlie, you got a healing anointing on your life. You're going to attract broken people. And I'm not mad at them. I'm just saying that now when I see it on somebody, I can tell them. But not, you got a healing anointing on your life. You're going to attract broken people. You could be associates with them, but to bring broken people into your inner circle, be careful. And I did that for so long and then wonder why I'm hurt. But I'm picking all these broken people that got backgrounds, nothing like mine. Fathers, nothing like mine. I'm picking these people to be close to me. Who saw totally different things than what I saw growing up. And it's okay to be associates with those people, but it's like you bringing somebody into your circle where I had a strong, loving, and I still do, strong, me and my dad, best friends, strong, loving, God-fearing father in your life who never did drugs, never drank, never cheated on your mama, provided a, a loving, stable home your whole life. But that's what I saw growing up. And then you bring people in your circle who didn't have that kind of father. Father was on drugs. You know what I'm saying? Crazy past. They're grown side baby, whatever the case may be. You try to bring these people close to you and just argument after argument. And really what you're dealing with is that they, the way they ha see the world and themselves is totally different than you. Because I was never supposed to bring them people close to me. Associates, pray for you is cool, but who you pick to be close to you has to be very, very similar, I believe, to how you grew up, how you see the world, your relationship with God. Now, if these people saw these things growing up and now they're saved, they're redeemed, they love God and the game has changed, okay, then that's a different story because everybody can change. But I'm talking about somebody who grew up this way and they're bitter because of it. Or they don't want to change, they don't want to learn, they don't want to grow. That's somebody, that's an associate. I attracted you because the healing anointing on me attracts broken people. I have an incredible ability to understand difficult people. I attract difficult people and broken people. But now I don't have the grace to be close to those people no more. I just don't. I can love you, love on you and pray for you at a distance, but I can't bring difficult, broken people into my circle no more because it just, it's cost me. It's cost me dearly, man. I got baby mamas and ex-friends that we was cool with and we fell out over something minor. And it's like, I didn't see that type of behavior growing up. Men didn't fall out over stuff that was minor. Like, my dad would have one-on-one -on -one discussions with people. And if it got that strong, let's go onto the alley and fight till we get tired. And then let's go eat after that. Like, my dad would whoop us and then take us to get ice cream after. Still love y'all. Don't like what you did, but still love you. So what was conditioned in my mind is correction comes from God. And just because somebody checks me don't mean that they hate me. But everybody don't have that mindset. You check somebody, they think you hate them. And then they all in this emotional spiral. Like they don't, they're not like, look, man, just because I corrected you on something don't mean I don't like you. I can separate behavior from a person. But if you didn't grow up the way I grew up, I got to do a 10 year learning session to bring you up to speed where I'm at. You know what I'm saying? All my life I've been in the Bible. All my life I know the word. All my life I've seen a functional, loving household. And like you get around me, your parents was on drugs. 
You don't love, you don't have no relationship with God. You ain't been to church. You hate your daddy. You don't know the word. It's like, man, it's going to cost me 10, 15 years to get you where I'm at. Well, I'm going to waste that kind of time. When I'm looking for an old school car, I'm looking for something that really don't need a whole lot of work at this point. I'm 46. Can I just put rims on it? Bang. Maybe put a cam in it. Something like that. But if it need a complete frame off restoration, too old. I don't deal with frame off restoration people bringing them close to me. I pray for you. But I'm not going to bring you close to me. Don't like what you did, but still love you. That's 1,000%. I can separate it. Like What you did and who you are is two totally different things. That's why I like when I'm talking to people, especially actors, and I can't even talk to you without you telling me what you've been doing for the last six weeks. How's your family, dog? How's your mental health? You cool? Stop telling me about all, all this, all that. That don't mean nothing to me. I've had a level of successes and I've had failures. I've done all of that. I just want to have a real conversation. But the problem is, is that who you are and what you do is the same. You're not your profession, fam. What's up, Ben Frank? Yeah, man, I'm careful how I pick people, man. How I pick people to be close to me. Now, an associate, that's fine. We chop it every now and then, pray. But a friend or relationship, people that I have close to me, you need a whole lot of work. And I put in the self-work. So also, too, after my traumas, I put in self-work, years of therapy, reading books. Here's a great book you should read, Taming Your Gremlin. If you've been through traumas and you're having trouble kind of getting over, read the book, Taming Your Gremlin. That's, I'm going to just say that. But I, I've, I've done so much self-work. So it's like if you've been through something, you ain't did the self-work, you're going to look for me to help give you your self-work. That's going to be a lot of work. You're taking from my babies. I got kids to raise. Anything I give to you is going to take from my babies. It's your job to get to where I'm at if you want to be with me. It's not my job to raise you up. We got to stop making our happiness someone else's responsibility. So weirdo, your happiness is not my responsibility. No, I'll never do Pea Valley, fam. I promise you that. <laughs> never do that. Yeah, Taming Your Gremlin is an incredible book, man. Never do Pete Valley. <laughs> Them dudes be on there doing, uh, well, I heard, because I've never watched Pete Valley, but I heard they be doing, yeah, you can't offer me. You know how many roles I've turned down? I wouldn't. I can't even tell you how the amount of money I've turned down. Like, Charlie, why don't you do this role in the shower scene? I'm like, man, I ain't available for that, dog. I ain't available for that at all. P stands for Diddy. I'm crying. You got to watch ads for back and knee braces to watch Charlie's videos. <laughs> Whatever, man. Whatever. You got uh, Velcro straps on your socks. So when you bend down to grab your ankles, you can stay down there for a little while. Dylan chilling. Who know about, um? man, somebody was asking me the other day if I ever went to, um, uh, Freak Nick. I was like, I never went to Freak Nick, man. We had Bell Isle every year. People don't know realize how live Detroit was. It's different now. It's corporate. It's more white people down there. It's it's, it's, it's it got a little weird. It's gentrified. You know, it ain't the city that I knew growing up. So from like ninety four to. I say 10 years from 94 to 04, in my opinion, Bell Isle was so off the chain and Jefferson. So you had, and this is in Detroit, you had several festivals that went on at Hart Plaza around the same time. You had the Summer Jam, which was free. You had uh, uh, the African American Festival, the Jazz Festival, Hart Plaza, free. I remember coming up the tunnel on the lodge. On the Jefferson, it's all brake lights because Jefferson was slapping. Everybody was in their car. It's half-naked chicks hanging out of their car. And everybody in old schools, dog, Bill Isle was slapping. I'm hanging, and I, oh, I had a clean old school every single summer from 93, 10 years straight. I did 10 summers. Every summer I had a new whip. 
I'm down there hanging out of the old school Monty or a Dell. I had a drop top Delta at a 79 Monty, you know what I'm saying? 350 Cuddy, photo Caprice on shoes. I always had a cold car with sounds in it. And I'm downtown and we just in and out of traffic on Jefferson, going to Belle Isle. But Belle Isle didn't cost no money. Belle Isle got weird. Some chick got through over the bridge on Belle Isle one time. Shout out to her. That kind of changed things up a little bit, but. Man, I'm talking about man, chicks pulling a uh 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 top halves out, bottoms out. It was so live on Bella. I'm my, one of my homeboys told a story. He said he was on Bella one time, and it was some dudes, some uh some questionable men, four of them in a drop top Sebring listening to a Usher song, coincidentally. And uh he said he watched them dudes. It was kind of, you know, bop, bop and doing their thing. And he said he watched some dudes in a Suburban pull up in a Suburban on like some, some shoes, sounds, pull up next to him and roll the window down. Hey, man, turn that music down. That's what they said to the dudes in the drop top. They refused to turn it down. He said he watched everybody in that Suburban hop out, beat up all them dudes in the Sebring and then reach over and cut the music off. <laughs> Bell out. You had the beach. Bell Isle used to slap. Slap. Never went to, never, I had no reason. Because every summer it was so lit. Video cameras, we was out. And my cousins, you know, they threw these freak parties. We'd be 20, 30 dancers. So after Bell Isle, we'd go to the freak party, do our thing. Man, I never had to go. And I remember every time, so here's the here's the blueprint for every old school that you ever bought when you lived in Detroit, and, and it's still there. So I buy old school. I go to D-Tech on Greenfield near Chicago, and I would get my Springs, Shocks, Flowmasters, my duels and stuff put on at D-Tech. D-Tech is still there. Everybody in the hood know where D-Tech is. You go in there, you get your Springs. Springs is you get your car lifted up so you get your shoes on, duels. Flowmasters at D-Tech. Carlos Rosada. You know what I'm saying? Then you go get your paint. You go get your sounds. You put a cam in or change the motor. My dad was a motor guy, so in most cases, I changed the motor. I done put big block 454s and some of everything. Monty, Cutlass. Get your motor game and all that right. Then you head downtown. Your motor rumbling. You got 415s in the trunk. You got your sounds, flows. You know what I'm saying? And then you just riding and dipping in and out of traffic, hollering at people. Then you stop the clubs. I went to back in the day. I went to Warehouse, Maxis. Maxis wasn't downtown. That was like Telegraph. But downtown was 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 Warehouse and River Rock. Bell was packed. VA Beach Strip was popping back in the day. See, we remember them times, man. I went to, I remember, uh, I remember somebody broke in my car at the River Rock one time. It was a club downtown. I had an old school, I had an 84 Cutlass with a 350 in it. I just got it painted and then I parked it downtown, but I parked it not too far from the club entrance under a light. You know what I'm saying? I know what time it is. So I was walking to my car one day and this dude walked up to me with a leather jacket on, leather jacket. He said, is this your car? And he pulled a badge out. I was like, yeah. He said, we caught three people trying to break in your cutlass. We got them in the back seat of the of the police car. And I looked and it was all chained up. Like, let us go, fam. And I was like, I talked to my homeboy. And he was like, he was with me. He said, man, we should let them go and follow them and, and beat them up wherever they're going. I was like, yeah, it's a great idea. Because the police officer was like, if you want to press charges on them, you got to follow us to the station in order for us to book them or we got to let them go here. I was like, let them go because I had this ulterior motive, right? So we follow. I watched them hopping like an old school Delta and we follow them to Livernois and Warren where the races was. And oh God, I promise you, they hopped out the car and joined up with about 20 people at Je right there on Livernois. And I looked at my homeboy like, Man, I'm kind of tired, man. I think we should go home. <laughs> Legends was my spot.
That's um, Charlie looked like a backhanded director for calling him cream soda. <laughs> oh man. Uh, what's the what's the titty bars I used to go to, man? My two titty bars was uh Brass Key and the Bear Facts. I was in Brass Key all the time. I remember I was in a Brass Key one time. It was my 22nd birthday. I was working at Ford. And I was on the assembly line. I paid somebody so I could leave. I gave somebody like 50 bucks to cover me for a few hours and I left. And I was in there. And it was like 10 of us from the plant because apparently everybody that I was with had paid somebody to leave work or whatever. And it was on break. And we in the titty, we in Brass Key and somebody's yelling my name on stage. Charlie! Looking around like, who calling me, man? Am I blow? And I looked on stage and I didn't recognize her big old booty. I was like, who is that calling my name? Charlie yelling my name from on stage. So after she got done with her dance on stage, she came to you like, you don't remember me from Romulus High School? I was like, no, I don't, I don't remember you. She said, you and your homeboy used to tease me in math class. And I still couldn't put it together. Oh, only reason, only I was just like, dang, I couldn't believe I was teasing you with all his ass. Yeah, you and you, you, and then I remembered her like, oh, I remember you had glasses. And she, and she was out here now, frame. I'm like, and then she said something that just changed my whole perspective because I was really looking at her like, okay, this is something that I want to hit. And she was just like, whispered in my ear, if you give me $40 so I can grab, grab my baby some groceries, I'll let you do whatever you want to do to me. And I was like, ugh. $40? That's what you've been saying to everybody all night. Ugh. What's in that box for the 40 ball? So that means if it's 40, you'll do it for 20. So you out here letting dudes smack for the 20 ball? Glad I was teasing you in high school. You a rat. Brass Key was wild. Then the Bear Facts. On Michigan Avenue. That was my spot. Same thing. I had went in there one day. It was some chick I used to hit was on stage. I saw her like, oh man, I used I was hit. I used to smack her. 40 is too much. And the Bible says a woman can be half a loaf of bread. <laughs> Listen, man, I didn't I I'm not a fan of buying no box. Not at all. I seen too much. My cousins used to throw these freak parties growing up. Like everybody thought I was gonna die when I had cancer at 15. So they my cousins was older cousins, they threw these freak parties. They took they took me out one day right after I had my first cancer surgery. We're gonna take you out, we're gonna show you a good time. And it changed my life. Cause they took me to a party. And when we went in, they blindfolded me. When we went in, they took the blindfold off. It was like 25 naked dancers with Mardi Gras masks on. And it was just like, you know, a party where people paid money to get in. And my cousins was like, this is birthday. Get him. And they started dancing on me, grinding on my lap. And I clapped in my pants, man. Had some corduroys on. I sprayed in my left pocket. I, I wet up all the quarters. And every weekend after that, it was a freak party. That's all I saw. Freak party, freak party. We it's Parties where dudes pay money to get in. And it's all these dancers and they pay money to go to the back. And when you see that over and over and over and over again, it desynthesizes you from real parties. So now I can't enjoy college parties, high school parties, because I'm seeing all this money, all these women. I'm like, where the hoes? This is what? Y'all standing around waiting on somebody to do something? You know what I used to do at parties? I got so wild and desynthesized when I would go to like high school or college parties and they it was this weird vibe. It'd be this weird sexual vibe in the air, but don't nobody know how to behave. And it's all these people standing against the wall. I would go upstairs or go wherever to the bathroom was, take off all my clothes and then come out of the bathroom completely naked and just yell to everybody. Anybody know where the toilet paper is? Where is the toilet paper? Naked. And that would just pop off the performance in the party because there was always one chick that's like, I saw you come out of the bathroom. <laughs> you crazy. <laughs> Facts, BMF from eCourse. That's what I'm saying. I was just thinking about that the other day, Frank. 
is people talk so much about people who not from Detroit, which it don't even matter to me. You ain't from Detroit. You from Inkster. You ain't from Detroit. You from Romulus. You ain't from Detroit. You from uh, wherever. You know BMF not from Detroit. They from E-Course. That's not Detroit. That's down river, just like Romulus, Inkster, Belleville. I, we got to stop with this narrative, which it don't even bother me. Whether you stop with it or not, I don't care. But this 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 narrative that where you from is an indication of who you are. It's crazy. It's not who you are. You know, I know some incredibly soft dudes that's from the city. I know some soft dudes from the from Inkster, but I know some killers from Inkster. For real. So at the end of the day, we attract who we are no matter where you're from. My city is right where, Byron, you know, when you land in Detroit, you really land in a city called Romulus. You know what I'm saying? That's where the airport is. That's where you land. And Detroit is actually 30 minutes. That's Romulus. That's where I'm. <laughs> hey, man, listen. Ink Town is wild. I lived in Inkster on Magnolia for years. It was wild. But I think one of the craziest things I've seen at one of them freak parties my cousins threw is there was a <laughs> there was a dude in there who was getting married the next day. And this was his bachelor party, right? And it was probably 20 women in there, maybe like 60 or 70 dudes, well, about 15, about 15 to 20 women in there. And there was one woman who was the lead dancer. She kept putting pool balls inside of her vagina and popping them out. That was her thing to pop out an eight ball, right? And everybody was trying to get a dance from her. Not me. Uh, I, I was just watching, but she was like, where's the dude that's getting married at? Where he at? Let's put him in the middle. So the dude that was getting married, she put him on a, in a chair in front of everybody. Dancers, she made a big circle. We <laughs> know circled around dog who was getting married and he like yeah yeah dance on me she made everybody watch so she starts dancing on him grinding on him she laid on the floor put an eight ball inside of her box popped it out and everybody oh put the show yeah yeah and then <laughs> things start to take a turn because she starts to unzip his pants and i'm like oh man what, what's happening here man i don't know if i want to continue to watch this so I go to leave. My cousin grabs my arm. No, 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 no. You stay. I'm like, man, I don't know if I want this. So she goes to pull out his hot dog. It is soft. So she, she, she starts to work his meat to get him wood. And I'm like, man, I don't want this. I don't know what's about to happen. He's about to get married. So then she starts to try to put a condom on his hat, but she can't because my, my dog is soft the entire time. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if he was like nervous because all these people was around or he didn't want to spray or what. But her dedication was so amazing. She was just trying to work a condom onto his soft pipe. So then she somehow managed to get it on, but he's still limp. And the crazy part about it is the whole time he's behaving like he was hard. Like, yeah. Oh. Ooh, yeah, do that, girl. I'm like, what, what does he feel? He's soft. Ooh, ah, yeah, girl. And then she tries to sit on him. And at that point, that's when I walked away. Like, I don't want none of this, man. I don't want this. Why is she trying to force this soft pipe into her box? He's not ready. But him behaving like he was ready. Ooh, girl. Ha, ha, ha. Oh. Mm, yeah, do it. <laughs> I had to get away. Like, all right, I'm out, man. I don't want this. So legend has it. He never got wood. He never got into the box. But her effort was so valiant. Shout out to her. Shout out to her for uh, trying to push that pipe into to her box. Um, What do I want to say? You know what? I think I want to just transition by saying I really wish we would stop being emotionally invested in the decisions of other people. If somebody wants to do that, 
you know, cool. If you had a party and you want to have a soft, soft pipe and you think you can put it into some box, I'm not emotionally invested in your decision. It's just that's what you do. You got to stop being emotionally invested in other people's decisions. Because sometimes you're dealing with people who don't have them all, especially if it's like a baby mama, divorce case, business case. You're dealing with people in business and you're trying to fight these things on your own and it's not making sense, and you emotionally invested in their decisions, the best thing I would suggest to you is to hire an attorney. Flat out. That's my transition into attorney. I'm going from soft lap dances to hiring an attorney. You got to hire an attorney, man, in, in some cases. It's some people that are not mentally or emotionally stable for you to deal with them, and it ends up draining you. Sometimes it's just worth it, man. Hire an attorney. You beefing with a baby mama, an ex, a business partner, you know, or an apartment complex, a crazy neighbor. Sometimes it's just worth the investment to hire an attorney. It's worth it. $5,000 retainer, $3,500 to save you your peace. Sometimes your peace of mind is just worth the money. Stop trying to battle these people who, you, who aren't emotionally, mentally stable. You don't see eye to eye. It's costing you all this energy. Hire an attorney, man. You know what I'm saying? I've had baby mamas who tried to keep my kids from me, do all type of crazy stuff. I had one baby mama, the one who shot me, actually. My son went to visit her for the summer. When it was time for her to return him, she kidnapped him. Wouldn't return him. Didn't know where she lived. Wouldn't answer my calls. Months later, my son calls me and say, Dad, where you at? Why you ain't come get me? I says, I'm crying on the phone. He crying, too. I'm like, son, I don't know where you at because I have full custody of him. And he was visiting his mom for the summer. I was like, dog, I don't know where you at. I love you. I try. He was like, I'm at this school, dad. And I'm so mad. I'm so emotionally invested in her decisions. What do I do? I go to the school. I drive down to Atlanta, go to the school, ask for him to be taken out of the school. I asked for him at the office, grabbed his hand and ran out to school. I'm talking about the principal. Everybody they running after me. <laughs> I'm driving off. They called the police on me. The helicopters came and swooped up on me and made me take him back to the school. That's how much I love my son and wanted a relationship with him. But I'm all emotionally invested in her decisions. But you know when things changed? When I hired an attorney. It was a $2,500 retainer. That attorney chewed her up, bust her upside the head, and made her return my son back to me. Sometimes you can't take matters into your own hands. You got to hire a professional, man. You know what I'm saying? So that's my advice to y'all, man. Sometimes it's best to just invest in an attorney, even in business. You sign the contract, whatever. They're not honoring the rules. Even when you rent an apartment or a house or, uh, you know, whatever. Instead of you being emotionally invested in their decisions and it's draining you, invest the money and hire an attorney. You know what I'm saying? Um... So let's recap. OJ did it. OJ murked Nicole Brown. OJ was having sex with his attorney's wife, Chris Jenner. She was Chris Kardashian at the time. So there's a picture of Chris Kardashian sitting next to her boyfriend, Bruce Jenner, while being at the trial of her lover, OJ Simpson. OJ did it. That's why he was running. You know what I'm saying? So, and 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 white people know, even now, when you say, he, like, I was in the gym today, and I was like, man, OJ, he died. I was watching it, and we was all talking. I could see the look in their eyes. It was like, well, you know, he did it. But, like, deep down, I'm like, I know he did it. I just didn't, I didn't want to tell you. Same way I don't want to tell you that Obama ain't really black. He's for the alphabet community, and he's half Nigerian and white. Obama's not black. Obama is on the other side. So. And he's taking people out who uh, don't agree with him. What else do we talk about? We talked about how uh, you got to be careful about people out here with uh, snap-on veneers. They got Velcro veneers out here now I've seen online. So the person you're talking to, they may not be their real teeth. You can look at my teeth. Look at how my bottom teeth kind of jacked up. 
These are my real chicklets, man. But you see somebody with a perfect set. They may be Velcro veneers. So at night, and they kind of stink sometimes, but they don't take care of it. So at night, if they snap off the Velcro veneers, you just realize that you've been catfished. Now you're all in love with somebody with no teeth. Uh, what else is a recap? We got to stop bashing certain groups of people based on a bad experience with that one person. You know, a dude had a bad experience with a couple of black women. He say all black women is trash. No, all the ones you picked was trash. Dude have a bad experience at a black church. All black churches is bad. No, you picked a bad black church. You got to do your research and take your time. Just like you shopping for a car or a house, do the same with churches, do the same with relationships. I went on a church tour for a year before I picked one. Prayed, went in there, caught the vibe. I went two or three times. I went to one church my homeboy recommended. He said, man, you should go to such and such church. Check it out. I went. It was so many bad broads in there. So many. And it was so flirtatious. They were so bad and thick. I was like, man, I won't make it here, dog. Because not only are they bad and thick, they're not leaving me alone. And I'm a recovering dirtbag. I can't go here. Like, I would cause drama in here because I'll be trying to knock down all of them. They bad. Can't go. True. Yeah, Ben, Frank, you was in the choir. I was in the choir too, man. First Baptist Church, Romulus, Michigan. I was in the children's choir. I was in the choir with my dad. In the male chorus, I sang in the choir, man. I used to do speeches at church. I grew up in church, dog. So that's the recap. You know, even all black businesses, when people make a generalization, black businesses is terrible. No, the ones you went to is terrible. It's some bad white businesses too. Stop making these generalizations based on your one or two bad experiences with this establishment. Yeah, I couldn't go to that church, Byron. I had to do my research. Got to do my research, man. And that's where I'm at now. So I think I've kind of find a pretty dope, found a pretty dope church after a year of doing research. And I, I even tried to go to like churches I used to go to. But <clears throat> studying psychology now has kind of hit me to some logical fallacies. There's a logical fallacy called appeal to tradition. And that means that you just based on what you've known or like, uh, You've been going to this church for several years. You just keep going and it makes you ignore certain things or because you had a relationship with a former pastor or whoever was at this church, you go to this church and that's an appeal to tradition. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best church for you just because of a past connection. You know, you got to and not saying anything is wrong with the church. It's just that you have to do your own research and pray and say, man, not just church. It could be a place of business you went to. It could be a school. It could be a community you used to live in. You think it's going to be the same community like the community I grew up in when I was younger. Ain't the same community now. The logical fallacy of appeal to tradition would be just because I grew up in this neighborhood in the 80s and 90s, I live there now. It would be the same just like when I was little. It's not the same. Logical fallacy. Appeal to tradition. Uh, there's so many appeals. There's another one. Um, you gotta look it up, but that's one of the things that I'm learning in this class. Uh, that you got to do your own research relationships, churches. When you buy a car, we get so mad at other people based on our own choices. Appeal to Carolina one says appeal to tradition is why we do so much in the life facts. My granny did this. My uncle lived on this block. My sister bought a car here. That don't mean that you got to do the same thing. You still got to do your research. We be, we be getting so emotionally invested in certain situations based on what our family or friends have done. And that may not necessarily be right. We, we repeat stuff that other people have said without even looking it up on our own. Things change. So look up the logical fallacies, man. I'll talk about them real quick. But appeal to tradition was definitely one of them. Where it's like, man, just because I, you know, knew this pastor or just because I went to this place or just because I, my granny, 
worked here or it's a logical fallacy is an error in reasoning that occurs when invalid arguments or irrelevant points are introduced without any evidence to support them. So appeal to tradition is definitely one of them. What's the other one? Oh, damn, this is a ton of them. Hasty general appeal to authority is the, the arguer claims an authority figure's expertise to support a claim despite this expertise being irrelevant and overstated. That's like uh, uh, Travis Kelsey supporting uh, Pfizer. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, since Travis Kelsey is supporting it, that means I should go take that. It's like, that's appeal to authority. Just because he's supporting that Pfizer jab don't mean you got to go take it. But when people see celebrities supporting certain things, they think that, oh, I should go do that. Appeal to ignorance is a claim that something must be true because it hasn't been proven false. Well, I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong. That don't mean it's true. Circular argument, this is a logical fallacy, is one that uses the same statement as both the premise and the conclusion. No new information or justification is produced. Peppers, here's an example. Peppers are easiest vegetable to grow because I think peppers are the easiest vegetable. Just because you think it, that's like people who worship their own thoughts. Just because you think it, you think it's true. So the way you avoid using logical fallacies is, the, is avoid... Logical fallacies in your work is to carefully think through every argument you make, tracing your mental steps to ensure that each step can be supported with facts and doesn't contradict other statements you've made in your work. Do this during the brainstorming stage so you can separate strong ideas from weak ones and choose which to include in your paper. Continue validating and when necessary, invalidating your ideas as you work through the outlining stage by noting the evidence you have to support your claims under each header. Man, just because something comes into your brain, just because some you hear something from a friend or a family member doesn't mean you have to go repeat it and believe it is truth immediately. Do a little work. Hey, that church over there on Seven Mile, don't go there, man. That that They be doing such and such. Then you just don't go. You ain't got no evidence to support none of that, whatever. Why not just go and see? You know what I'm saying? Uh... But also, to the flip side, is just because I'm the type of person. I saw a whole bunch of bad women in one church. You know that was my small. That has been my weakness over the years. So just because that has been my weakness over the years, you may go to that church and love it. That's why I didn't say the name. So what works for me, you know, you may have a different, uh, different proclivities. So, hey, man, I had a good time. You know what I'm saying? Live shows coming up soon. We'll put the website in the in the chat. Appreciate all y'all support, man. Uh, you know, check out all my other platforms, Instagram. You can check it out. Who cares? I don't, you know, honestly, man, I don't care what you do. I'm glad y'all tuned in. I don't. I ain't doing this for likes and subscribers and views. This is therapeutic for me. I love connecting to the community. I don't care if you don't do anything after this at all. I just appreciate y'all tuning in. Uh, you know, I love y'all because I love myself. <laughs>